then you become defeated by your own fear. Somebody said, what do you say, Reverend? Often we become defeated in our own lives because of our own fears. That comes from a lack of communication with our protector. You know, a child doesn't worry about being protected because mama, daddy's got their back. And we as Christians need to learn that God has our back. And so as we pray today, I invite each of you, as I have, to search your heart. Ask God to renew a right spirit with in you. And allow you to stand on the promises that he's made to you. Pray with me. Father, we come to you today. We thank you for your amazing grace. God, the grace that saved a wretch like each one of us. Your word declared that while we were yet sinners. Christ died that we might be set free. And we come to you, God, this first Sunday of 2013, realizing that we want to walk in the freedom that you have given us. And so we come today, God, asking you to first of all forgive us of all of our sins and our ignorance. But realize that in order to be able to communicate with you, God, that effectively we need to repent. And so we ask forgiveness even now. And then, God, we claim and we declare that you are the Lord of our life. God, we ask you as the word declares that you would help us to lead not to our own understanding. But in everything, acknowledge you and allow you, God, to direct yes, yes. our path. Yes. God, we come today recognizing that you have declared that the cause of your son, and we are in your son, God, that our sins have been forgiven. Yes, yes. Which simply means, God, that you don't hold us accountable for them anymore. Yes. And so I pray now, God, for each and everyone under the sound of my voice. God, that this year we will begin to proclaim that we are victorious in Christ. That we are more than conquerors. That we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And God, that we will serve notice on the devil and let him know that we realize that he has power, but he does not have all power because you gave that to Jesus. And we have authority through his name to call those things that are not as though they were. We have authority through the name of Jesus to pass Satan back to the pits of hell for which he came in. So I come now, God, against every trick. I come, God, against every deception that he has brought to the church, that he's brought to our families right now. In the name of Jesus. God, I declare that we are going to walk in victory. We are going to walk according to your word. So this is what you have told us in your word. Now God, we invite you into these services. We realize, God, that without you, there would be no need to be here. So we ask you now to move, God, from the pulpit to the door. Yes, God within the building, God, but begin to move on our heart. Help us to move, God, from the natural. We, we say it each Sunday, but God, I, I'm asking you right now, God, that you would really begin to move on our heart, God. That we might begin to grow, that we might be able to receive me, God, that we might be able to become a witness in the stablehood in our homes and on our jobs. 
move from heart to heart and from rest to rest. Yes. Usher us, God, from the natural realm into the spiritual realm. Help us to forget about a program, God. Help us to forget about ourselves and help us to get lost in you. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, fall on you and afresh on us even now. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, move through this place now. God, your people stand at the altar. Some stand in the congregation. God, you know what it is that they stand in need of. I pray now, God, that as they exercise their faith, as they petition you, God, for whatever it is that they need according to your word, that you will begin to move and show them, God, that you're not just the God of Abraham. You're not just the God of Isaac. You're not just the God of Jacob. That you don't just ask a prayer for bishops, you don't just ask a prayer for apostles, you don't just ask a prayer for preachers, but you answer the prayer of your people. For the perfect prayer of the righteous, the faith of much. This is our prayer on today. God, remember our service men and women all over the world. Remember those who lost loved ones in the world terrorists. God, we pray that it's no longer business as usual, but that we be about our Father's business. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, God. You are our strength and our redeemer. In the blessed name of Jesus Christ, I pray and I thank you. The redeemed of God said, Amen. Amen. Amen.
we need His Spirit. His Holy Spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody clap your hands. Somebody excited. Yes. yes. Somebody give a sigh of need. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You had to call on his name the way you call on him. You call on him and he did what he did. Yes. And from that moment on, you've been called on like you've never called on before. Yes. Yes. Even though someone else has been the song, you learn for yourself that there's no other name like the name of Jesus. Somebody was cursing you out all in your face, spit coming in your face. You just had to say, Jesus! Child, man, it like it didn't have no sense. Like you wouldn't want to burn them. Like you wouldn't want to burn them, provide some food for them, or put some food in the refrigerator. And you just had to say, Jesus! And all you could do, you couldn't call the doctor's name, you couldn't call your wife and your husband's name, Lord. you couldn't call nobody's name but Jesus!
abide and able to us, God, in this year to serve you with purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Last week we left some handouts that are still in, in, in the back of this handout of living by the book. If you did not pick one up, we ask that you go ahead and get one on your way out it's on the table um, in the best of you. If you did get that, if you didn't read it, we're going to ask that uh, this week you go ahead and read it because it will help you along with this sermon series um, that we are preaching. And that is the anatomy of a functional church family. So we will be talking about the anatomy of a functional church family part two on this morning. We also did some training on this past Wednesday at Bible study. And our premise is that a functional home family facilitates a functional church family. And there's too many churches that look good on the outside of all types of ministries that are going on, but they are dysfunctional like a lot of families. They look good on the outside. People think everything is fine, but on the inside, the family is dysfunctional. And unfortunately, in dysfunctional families, most folks don't want to admit that they're dysfunctional or you don't even know. I shared my testimony. I didn't know I was dysfunctional until I started to see how families were supposed to operate. So, uh, your pastor, the first admit, I grew up in a dysfunctional family. But I thank God that he realized he loved me enough that he adopted me into a fully functional family. And I'm okay now. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Sister Mark said I'm crazy, but I'm still okay. Amen. Ephesians 5.24 says, Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. A lot of times when preachers get in trouble when we preach on uh, this particular scripture, because we live in a time and age where the devil has brought about so much deception and he has come against the family to the point that what we call normal now is not normal according to the word. And so what Paul was saying to this church at Ephesus uh, was for the women to have deference, not difference. Something. I got a difference with it. Every time you don't do what I tell you, I'm indifferent. Not difference, but deference, which means the act or attitude of deferring, a yielding of judgment or preference out of respect for the position. And if you, whether you realize it or not, that's what we do when we surrender our lives to Christ. When we allow Jesus to be Lord of our life, we submit or we perform deference because we have our own will. There's things that we want to do that Christ will tell us we don't need to do. There's places that he will tell us to go that we don't want to go, but because we understand his position, we yield to him and not to our own. As a matter of fact, this thing is not a phenomenon because Jesus did the same thing. You realize when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed three times, Lord, if it be possible, if it be thy will, if, if, if you can, Daddy, please let this cup pass from me. But he ended it by saying, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And I was thinking, my brothers and sisters, if we're going to have a functional church and we're going to have a functional family, that, that family must be a family that overall submits to the will of God. There are some things that the family may want to do. There may be some things that the family want to hide, but we're going to have to submit to the will of God. And so what he was saying here to the woman was to uh, submit, have deference. Uh, uh, he, he says to her to, 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 to render and have reference, reverence to her husband. Well, let's not get too far. Uh, the purpose of this sermon series is to reacquaint some and introduce others to the order that God ordained for the family, the church, and 
the Godhead and examine how adherence to that order facilitates a functional individual relationship with God, a functional family, and a functional church. In other words, what I'm just saying is that when we have God's order in our life, we have a right relationship individually with God because each of us, no matter how much we love our spouse, our children, our family, we have to make a confession of faith on our own. We have to have our own relationship with God. Amen. And so when we are obedient to God's order, it facilitates us having a better relationship, individual relationship. Our individual relationship will bleed over into our family relationship, and our family relationship will bleed over into our church relationship. The reason, again, that so many churches are messed up in this function is because the folks in the church are messed up in this function. And from our perspective, if we're out of order at home, then we're going to get in church and be out of order too. If we disrespect authority in the home, we're going to disrespect authority in the church. All right, all right. Now you don't have to say amen because I'm going to teach it whether you do or not. Hosea, I'm going to submit to you that order and rank are no strangers to any of us. And like it or not, agree with it or not, we follow it to avoid the consequences of not following. Just what are you talking about, Reverend? Think about it with me. From the very first days of our life, there was an adult, a parent figure. Then there was us, the child, a subordinate figure. Uh, we progressed uh, from being rocked in the cradle and held in our mother's and father's arms to, to school where there was a principal, a teacher, mm -hmm. a counselor, uh -huh. even a janitor, and then there were students. All right. We were the students. Uh, the principal outranked the teacher. The teacher outranked the counselor, and the counselor outranked the janitor, but the janitor outranked us because we were just a student. The ranking system didn't stop there. Even among the students, there was an order and a rank. There uh, was a senior who outranked the junior. There was a junior that outranked the sophomore, the sophomore that outranked the freshman. And so the ranking system was still in place. This system of order and rank continued on in college. And for those that progressed from school to the workforce, uh, lo and behold, there was an order and rank system on the top. There was a boss. Maybe a whole host of supervisors. There were folks who did the same thing that we did but had been there longer so they had seniority and then there was us. Uh -huh. uh, the problem with this is that we don't have any problem in these types of settings with order and rank. Those who have been in the military you know there's an order and a rank system and you're taught to respect it whether you respect the person. And if we're going to get along in society, we have learned that there are consequences against bucking the order and the rank system. However, the devil has convinced many of us that when it comes to the most important institution in the world, that is the family, that we don't want order, nor do we want to admit that there is a ranking system. Mm. Our brothers and sisters, for the most part, we have accepted and respected this system of order and rank except for when it comes to the nuclear family. And now we have families where children raise themselves. What do you mean, Reverend? Yeah, there's an adult in the house, but uh, the adult doesn't raise the child. The child does what they want to do, eat what they want to eat, go to bed when they want to go to bed, watch what they want to watch, and uh, have the nerve even to tell the parents what to do. And what's a strange phenomenon is that in this day, some parents are doing what the children tell them. Then there's households where uh, the husband wants to do what the wife is supposed to do, but the wife wants to do what the husband is supposed to do. Uh, 
And somebody said, well, why is that? And that's because, in general, it's caused by sin. Mm. The sin of disobedience and the sin of rebellion. But more specifically, generations of generational curses. Years of perpetuated slave mentality, ideologies, and government interference. Oh, then I proclaim to you today that all three of these factors that influence family and ultimately influence the church can be eradicated through prayer, education, and obedience to the word of God. Amen. Yes. As we get prepared to understand God's order and God's ranking system. Look with me at Genesis 3. I, I, I want you to open your Bibles and, and read along with me. I'm going to be reading from the King James Version. Genesis 3. As a matter of fact, what I do so we all read on the same note, I'll read from this Bible. Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, we find the fall of man. You may have heard the story of Adam and Eve. God gave them some directions and they didn't follow those directions. While some may wonder, uh, uh, was Eve with Adam when she ate up the forbidden fruit or was Adam someplace else? All of that is really not important. What's important is that God gave Adam some instructions for him and his wife. Uh, whether he was there when the devil deceived Eve or not, uh, Eve gave him the fruit. Whether he knew where it came from or not, he ate it. And in verse number 14, we're going to see the consequences of that. And see how God establishes and why God established the order that he had given. Because before this, he had given man dominion over the earth. In other words, even the devil, up to the point of the sin, uh, while he was the prince of the air, God had given Adam dominion over everything. He told him to name everything. Uh, he got to name his wife after God performed the first uh, operation. He put Adam to sleep and, and opened him up and took the strip out and he created Eve. And, and somebody says, when, when he looked at it, it must have been pretty because he said, whoa, man. Uh, but then after they sinned, at verse number 14, it says, So the Lord God said to the servant, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. There is a consequence of sin. It says, He says, The Lord said to the servant, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust. All the days of your life, between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. We know that in, 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 in to be the reptile the state that we know, but that was who the Satan used, and so there was a consequence. Now, watch this. What's your name? Say, David. Watch this. Verse number 16 says, to the woman, he said. Now I want you to understand something. Before, every time that God came to the garden, he talked to Adam first. Except for this time. And he comes and so, now he's talked to the servant. And he came and asked Adam where Adam was at. Adam gave him that excuse that the woman that you gave me uh, gave me the fruit. And now when he starts this discourse of the consequence, he deals with the serpent. Then he deals with the woman. He says to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. And without epidurals and, and, and meditation, uh, women still experience that today. Amen? <laughs> He says, your desire shall be for your husband. And if a woman is true, there is a desire in her. If she doesn't have a man, to have a man. And then that man is to provide protection for her. He says, and he shall rule over you. Is that what the Bible says? 
Now, let me ask you something. Is that what your Bible says? Yes. Don't get mad with me, bitch. You get upset with God. Now, that does not mean that a, 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 a man, this rule is not the sense that, that, that the man is a master and the woman is a slave. It's, it's, it's the same sense that God in his Godhead, while God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one, Jesus as the Son is ruled by his Father. There is still a ranking system. Do we understand that? Yeah. And then he says to Adam, verse number 17, then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and you have eaten from the tree, which indicates that Eve must have had a conversation with Adam prior to Adam and Eve. Can anybody see that? Uh, I don't think that's an isogenesis. I think that's a good exogenesis. He says, and, uh, because you have heeded the voice of your wife. And, and, and I've said this, that beside every good man is a good woman. And I, I used to say this to my wife. I developed this idea in high school that uh, a good woman will get a man to do anything that she wants him to do. And they just go back to, to right here. Now you don't have to agree with that, that's my phenomenon. All right? Uh, but that's, that's, that's what I said. But he says, heed the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth from you, and you shall eat the herbs of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for our men were taken from dust you are, and to dust you shall return. God establishes the order and the rank system in the family. Uh, some would say that, 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 that Paul did it as he speaks here in Ephesians, but I want to understand uh, Adam and Eve were not Jews. Adam and Eve were of no uh, ethnicity. They were of no particular culture. So we can't say, well, that was the culture of the time. Adam and Eve were an institution that God created, which was marriage. They didn't know what marriage was until God created and turned it marriage. And so he created this great system. Now what I was speaking to you is that when we can't understand that rank system or can't follow that rank system, then it becomes difficult in the church. Because, let's think about it, really. If a woman can't reference or reverence her own husband, that she can see. Uh, how in the world can she reverence God that she can't see? Okay, amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> But now I want to move, because we want to establish, I want to move to, to what God says to the husband. If you notice in Ephesians 5, there's three verses that talk to the wife. Um, we talked about those on last week. But I want you to look at how many verses he uses to talk to the husband. Over twice as many. Somebody said, well, Reverend, what are you trying to say? The husband is given a higher rank because he's given more responsibility. And with more responsibility comes more work. Look with me at his teachings. Five and twenty-five. He says, husbands, love your wife. Just as Christ also loved the church. If you sit next to your husband, I want you to say, baby, you're supposed to love me as Christ loved the church. Now, I can't speak for nobody else but for me. Uh, over 20 years ago when I married Sister Martha back then, I did not understand this. And so when I married her, I loved her. Tell us, you are a big mom. Say, oh, she believed me. She, she, she had my eye, and I love her. But I didn't understand that as a husband, I was supposed to love her as Christ.
Christ loved the church. I, I love the way that she looked. I love the times that we spent together. I didn't understand that I know how Christ loved the church, but I didn't know then that I was supposed to love her in the same way that Christ loved the church. We understand sensual love. And the thing about sensual love is that, uh, you know, she don't look like she did when I got married, but I don't look like I did when I got married. You know, I, I had a little more hair, and that was about 30 pounds lighter. I could run a lot faster than I could keep down. I don't even run at all now. Uh, so, so we change it. So when you fall in love with looks, when you fall in love with what a person does for you, when they don't look the same, you fall out of love. When they don't do the same things anymore, you fall out of love. But when you learn to love husbands your wife as Christ loved the church, then you understand what love really is. It's no longer lust, but it's real love. So he says to the husbands, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now, this is as important to the wife as it is to the husband. Because if you don't understand how that church is supposed to be treated, you don't know what to pray for. And so you need to know what he's supposed to be doing so that you know that you are loved. Other than that, we do what, uh, uh, I think his name is, 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 is Gary Chapman. He has a book out called The Five Love Languages of Love. And he talks about filling up your love tank. But if you don't know what your love tank is, you don't know whether it's full or whether it's empty. And so what we do is that is the things that we have learned to do what we think uh, that, that we do because we love somebody else. We expect them to do those same things for us. But don't you know if you come from a dysfunctional family and your definition of love is dysfunctional, then you're expecting somebody to do something dysfunctional for you to show you that they love you. Then you come to church and expect the church to be dysfunctional so that you believe that you are loved by the church. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. When he talks about here, somebody will say, well, that sounds like protection and security. Now, ladies, how many of you, when you think about or thought about getting married, you want somebody that can protect you and provide you with security? Any ladies here this morning? No? Oh, this is a model that I got more work to do than I thought. God put something in a woman in that, 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 that causes you to be sure for security and protection. Uh, let me ask this question. How many of you heard something go bump in the night and you went and took care of it or you told your nudge your husband and told him to go take care of it? <laughs> if you nudge your husband and told him to go take care of it, you want to protect you that security. Uh, he says, but, but not wife as Christ also loved the church that he gave himself for but it was more than just protection and security why did he give his life for her look at verse 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word so husbands how are we supposed to love our wives we must understand that in loving our wives we love them for their Continue salvation. When you love your wife for her continued salvation, you will change the way you make choices and decisions. Right. See, a master will just make a decision that's based off of what's convenient for the master. Your boss will make decisions based off of what your boss thinks is convenient or most important for the company. God made a decision to send his son. His son Jesus made a decision not based off of his position because he was already in heaven with God, but he made a decision based off of what was best for the church. Therefore, a husband, because he loves his wife the way that Christ loved the church, will make decisions based off of what's best for her spirituality. Sometimes what's best for her spirituality is not what you and so it doesn't become we're doing this because I say so. It becomes we're doing it because this is what the Bible says and this is what's best for our family. He says that he might sanctify and cleanse her through the washing 
of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without limit. Now, I presented this in, in Bible study, and this may mess some of your minds up. Christ loved the church. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. He gave himself for her. He gave herself for her sanctification. He gave herself that, that she could be presented to him without spot or blemish. What, what do you mean without spot or blemish? The church is Christ's bride. Now look at this. Christ is male. The church is if, if, if Christ is male, then the church is female. The church is female. Christ being the male figure, the high rank, the church is to submit unto Christ as the wife is to submit unto the church. Now, I'm all men. Amen? Although I'm all male, my position is I'm not Christ. I'm a part of the church. And so spiritually, my function becomes the function of the wife. I'm not in charge of HHNBC. I just have a position by rank that God has put me in. But the church is female, which means I have to know how to submit unto God. And if I submit unto God, then I'm not going to do anything to my wife that God doesn't want me to do. Amen. And so when women, if you can understand that if your husband is loving you the way that Christ loves the church, you should have no problem with submitting unto him. Because he's not trying to be a master. He's just in the position that God put him in. Last week I pulled my ring off and I said, and I asked him, I asked those who are here. When we look at that ring, that ring symbolizes unity of a husband and a wife. You can't tell where Reverend Hill starts and stops and where Sister Martha starts and stops. However, God has put a right system in our family. And he has made me because I'm the male, that's what he decided I was going to be. Then I am the one that he holds responsible for the family. And I have a higher call than she does. So when he comes with stuff not going on in the mouth of the house or the way it's supposed to go on, he comes to me and holds me responsible for it. When stuff doesn't go on, HHNBC the way it's supposed to go on, God holds me responsible. Amen. And that's why I'm telling you where your position is. It is too many folks in the church that want to be the male of the church no. in the spiritual church. In other words, they want to be in charge. But the thing about being in charge is being in charge comes with a responsibility. Because God has placed me in the position, because we all have to go through Christ, then I'm responsible for your soul. In other words, if I don't do what God told me to do in that position, then God will punish me. But you know what happens in the church? The church wants to punish the pastor, and in the household, the wife wants to punish the husband. We say, you know what? I'm going to get a joke with three chances. Some of you. Some of you don't give him but one chance. But I'm going to give him three chances. If he don't get it done, I'll get it done myself. That's not what the Bible calls for. I, I, my time is moving on. Let me, let, let me move to verse number 28. It says, so, so the husband is to love the wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for. Verse 28 says, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own body. Why did he say husbands ought to love their own wives? Why did he just say husbands ought to love their wives? Well, perhaps he understood that there were some husbands that wanted to love their wives and your wife and whoever else's wife that they could love. And so he says husbands ought to love their own wives. As their own bodies. Now, unless you're crazy, you know, women usually show vanity more than men, but in this day, men and women both show vanity. No man is going to hurt himself. He's going to take care of himself. He's not cutting himself up. He, he, he's not going to, to, to just let himself go if he's in the right mind. So, what it's saying is, if, if you are led by God. Husbands will all to love their wives as their own bodies. You don't beat yourself up. So the man's got no business beating up 
on his wife. And why you want to know that your husband ain't got no business beating up on him. Some of you say he can pull his hand if he won't. He'll pull back a nerve. I'm saying he can hit me. He don't have but one time to hit me. And if he hits me, that's it. Uh, you got a Smith and West 45, some kind of something. But, 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 but that's how the world handles it. Can I just be real? All right? So some of you, 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 you tell them you might be bigger than me, but you can hit me if you want. You know what? It should never get to that point. Amen. Because God said, love your wives as you love your own body. It says, he who loves his wife loves himself. Why does he love his wife love himself? Because they are one. Are you with me? But no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Think about it. Think about how disobedient you were in 2012. I was disobedient in 2012. Think about how disobedient you were. I know you don't want to, but think about it. Irregardless of our disobedience, Christ still loved us and blessed us. Everybody that's here, God still blessed you. Christ still blessed you. And even though you messed up when he positioned before the judge God, he says he positioned without spot or limits. In other words, he positioned as being clean. You ever heard of a husband that just, just bad mouth his wife? Just, just talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. He doesn't understand that he's talking about himself. And he doesn't understand how to love us the way Christ said he's supposed to love. Now, I say this to Sister Bob. This is in our house. You know, I'm not a big guy. And, you know, we about the same side now. So she want she hit me the right way. She, she, she might knock me out. Can, can, can I just be honest? Um, and, and, and she got good sense. She grew up in the country, so she's not going to hurt her fish. She's going to get a skillet or something. Yeah, she, she knows she can knock me out. Uh, but, but we established something. I don't put my hands on you to hit you, and you don't put your hands on me to hit me. All right? Because that's not what God calls me. Let, 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 let me move. For as members of his own body, of his flesh and his own body, this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. What Paul was saying here, that up until this point, God had not revealed it. Don't get all deep on me today. today. He wasn't saying that understanding this was a mystery, but he said up until this point, it had not been revealed. That the parallel between the church and Christ is the same parallel that we have in the family. And so, can we understand that as he continues to go on and says, Nevertheless, let each one of you remember so love his own wife as himself, and let his wife see that she respects her husband. This word respect here means to reverence. That's why Sarah called Abraham Lord. And uh, some of you ladies say, well, if he showed me respect, then I'll respect him. You disrespect me, then I'll disrespect you. But did you see that in the word of God? It didn't. What, what if Christ decided that he was going to treat us based off the way that we treat him. What if he said, you know, you haven't been praying like you ought to pray. So since you're not doing that for me, I'm just going to kind of forget about you this morning. So you woke up this morning, you were alive. But he decided that he was going to forget to touch you so that you could see. Then somebody else, he, he forgot to stop by so that when you stood up on the side of your bed that your legs would hold you up. 
And then for some, he decided he stopped by. He, 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 was, he was so busy doing his own thing, he, he forgot to come by and touch you with the breath that causes you to breathe. So the undertaker came and, and carried you away. God doesn't do that to us. And what he does is that he loves us and gives us what we need regardless of what we do. And you know what some of us husbands, we say, you know, wife, if you make me happy, I'll make you. You have. And that's not what God said. God calls us to do what he said. It's not about me. I've got to do what God says to regardless to whether Sister Martha does what he says or not. Can I just be honest with you? I was when he said yes to me. Then when I learned this, there, there were some things sometimes uh, Sister Martha would do some things that I didn't like. Imagine that. Uh, and then, then I, 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 I think about it and I figure out what I was going to do and then the Holy Spirit would talk to me and, and say do the right thing. <clears throat> you know how hard it is to do the right thing when somebody just made you mad? <laughs> you know how hard it is to do the right thing when you told somebody to do one thing and they went and they did something else and because they did something else now you got to do something that you wasn't planning on doing? It's, it's, it's hard. But that's what God calls for us to do. And he didn't say treat her right and she treats me right. No. I have to treat her right anyway. And women, you've got to understand you've got to treat him right anyway. Let, let me show you this and I'm going to close it up because we passed 1 o'clock and some of your internal clocks and said it's time to go. You have God, the Father, You have the son. And the Holy Spirit. The Bible declares that all three are one. In the spiritual realm, while there's still one, there is order and rank. Imagine if the son, when he came to the earth, he said, you know what? I'm equal with the father. So he's in the garden of Gethsemane. He wouldn't have been praying, Father, if it be possible, remove this cup from me. He wouldn't be saying, Father, if it's thy will, remove this cup from me. He said, you know what? I'm equal with him. I'm going to just decide I'm not doing it. Do you know what it would be if he had decided he wasn't going to do it? Still lost. You wouldn't be here listening to me today and ready to go. <laughs> then there's the Holy Spirit. I'm just real. I know you're ready to go, but I ain't telling the preacher. So, if you want to leave, go ahead. The Son, then there's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to be submissive to the Son. So, the Holy Spirit is the God that's in us, that we carry with us each and every day. But if the Holy Spirit decided that He doesn't want to listen to the Son, the Son doesn't want to listen to the Father, we got chaos going on. Matter of fact, we were so, we would be worse than what they call schizophrenia. Because if we're saved to have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit trying to do his own thing. We read the Word of God. The Word of God tells us to do something else. We don't know if the devil talking to us or the Holy Spirit is talking to us or us talking to us. We would just be all messed up. But there is a right system even in the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We will accept that but when we come down to the family. There's the father, the mother, and the children. There is a rank system in this too. Why he says, now watch this. This relationship, all three are one. He says these two become one. Clearly identifying that these two are over the children. But these two become one. But just as God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there is a rank and an order. There's a rank and an order in this. Now, we talked about, and I'm about to close, a functional church. Amen. Amen. There's God, the pastor, male or female, and the church. Amen. There has to be an order. That's right. I've got to be in line with God. 
God disciplines me. Church does not discipline me. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. It's, not it's not our job. God disciplines the pastor. I'm just in a position. Because people get out of the position of pastor. If I go across the border to pastor the church, while I'm a member, and I'm under pastor me, I'm not the pastor. Alright? And so it's not me, it's the position. So whoever God puts in this position, the church is to respect that position. Whoever God put as your husband, you need to respect the position, even if you still don't respect him. But you ought to respect him. And then there's the church. The church becomes like the children. You're not my children. God knows. And that's good. <laughs> you are God's children. I'm just in the position of taking care of you and feeding you what God gives to me to feed to you. If the church is going to function, Hosanna, the way that it's supposed to function, you've got to understand your position. And you've got to support my position. Which means in 2013, and I'm getting ready to go. We're not going to do things status quo. It's no longer business as usual. We're going to do it God's way. Amen. That's the only way I know how to do it. Amen. Right? I'm not giving you the automated. Somebody's waiting for the automated. I'm not giving it to you. We're just going to do things God's way. Amen. I'm in a position that he put me in because he put me in. I didn't ask to be in. I didn't ask to be born a male, but that's what he made me, so I'm living my life all male. And he put me in a position to pastor, I'm going to be the best pastor that I can be. And guess what? You're going to be the best church that you can be. A functional family is required for a functional church. Next week, we're going to talk about children. So, come on back, we'll talk about with, with, with children function is in the family and how that affects the church. Amen. 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 While we don't normally do it, I may even get to a Sunday that I entertain some questions. But until then, if you have some questions, write it down. Don't put your name on it. Put it in the suggestion box. And I declare that I will address those questions. The reason we have dysfunctional families is because of sin and disobedience. I told you before, nobody had to teach us how to be disobedient. Nobody had to teach us how to sin. The Bible declares that the way of sin is death. What happens is that the family dies. You're physically alive, but the family is dead. And that's what makes a family dysfunctional. There's no communication. There's no effective the role, while God has identified them and set the order, there's no order in the family. Everybody's just doing what they want to do because of sin. But we don't have to be that. And so if you're here today and you don't know Christ, then you really don't know the order. If you would like to get your life back on track, Get your life in order. And I'm not going to ask you to stay. I want you to stay safe. want to get your life back in order. If you need to If you are saved, and it's saved in 2013, 2012, and things just didn't go right for you. Try to do it on your own. Seems like your prayers were going. Things just didn't work right. Perhaps you're out of the world. The Bible declares that when you hear my voice, when you hear the voice of God, it's not him, but God speaks to you. When you hear his voice, he's saying, get it in all. Like I told Hezekiah, get your house in order. He said to Hosanna, Hosanna, get your house in order. Your house at home, your house, the church, get it in order. 
because we will surely die. You have an opportunity. Every eye can open. Every eye can Every head bowed. I don't want anybody to come out of anybody else. If you realize that your house is out of the way, and you've been disobedient, you've been bumping God's system. With every eye closed and every head bowed, I just want you to slip your hand. The first thing that we need to do in order for God to work with us is that we have to admit. That we have sinned. And I've got both hands on them. I don't know how. So we want to do, we're going to pray in our hearts the way we normally do it. So you go ahead and say, I didn't open the doors of the church, but I'm, I'm doing what God tells me. Amen. Father, We come to you today realize you have said it all. And sometimes God is hard for us to follow the Lord. We want to be independent. We want to be in charge of our own destiny. When we come and when we go, what we wear, how we look, who we talk to, who we don't talk to, what church we go to, what time we get there, when we leave. But the truth of the matter, God, is that you allowed your son Jesus to purchase with his blood. And we are no longer our own because we were bought with that price. And so God, we come to you, I come individually asking you, God, to forgive me for my disobedience. And then I ask you, God, to forgive us collectively. Help us, God, to get our families in order. Help us, God, not to be influenced by man, legislation, the tricks of the devil, God. He has come against the family to the point now, God, that even our governments, some places are redefining what only you were able to accept. Help us, God, to get in line with you. God, touch every husband that is here today. Help each of us, God, to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Help us to understand how he loved the church. That he gave his life, not just for her protection, but for her salvation. Help us to love our wives as we love our own bodies. And then help us to love our wives as we love ourselves. Realizing, God, the difference that one is physical and one is mental. And God, I pray that that order would bleed over into the church, that HHNBC would become a functional church. And that we be able to evangelize, God, that people, men and women, that, that are hurting, that are lost, God, that that are depressed, Father God, that Father God have been taken over by Satan, that they would be able to come and we would be able to minister to them. Because we've allowed you to minister to us. This is our prayer and our petition. God, give us a clean heart. Renew the right spirit within us. Help every wife to become submissive to their own. 
Not as to them as a man, but as unto Christ. As the church is missing unto Christ. This is our prayer and our petition. In Jesus' name. The church said, Amen. 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 So I don't get in trouble. If you get in there and you want to join in, you see the great church of the CSR name. Oh, is there one? Don't worry about us. Don't worry about us. Is there one that would like to come?